Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana di Marimò della New York University for the presentation of Machiavelli Portrait, the new book by Christopher Celenza. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to host this event for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I met uh, Chris Celenza a long time ago when we were both grad students in Florence, uh, and uh, Chris would come to the Stanford campus in Florence to listen to Professor Pacero's uh, classes on Dante, and that's uh, around the early 90s, That's right. let's put it this way. And um, Chris had a, a brilliant career. He's a classicist. He actually has two PhDs, uh, one in history and one in classics. And his specialty is the Latin Renaissance, the Latin humanism. Um, so he's an historian with a strong training in classics. And I think that's something that we will see uh, emerges in, in, in his uh, approach to Machiavelli. Um, Tonight, to present uh, Christian Linz's book uh, here at the Casa, we have the chair of the Department of Italian Studies uh, at New York University, Virginia Cox. Um, Virginia is a, a specialist of the Italian Renaissance. She published extensively. Her interests range from rhetoric, the art of rhetoric, to women writers. And there are three major volumes that uh, Virginia published recently. Um, uh, an enormous work that she has done, um, proving wrong many of the commonplaces about uh, women and writing, especially in Italy. The, the common assumption that women didn't have a voice um, was proven wrong by just by the sheer number of uh, uh, publications that Virginia was able to uh, recognize, discuss, comment uh, in her books. Her upcoming book is a book on the Renaissance, I would say very much in line with the book we are presenting tonight. It's what in Italian we would call alta divulgazione. Uh, it means when a university professor takes off his robe and <laughs> comes down a few steps and starts talking to the real people, intelligent, educated people that are not necessarily graduate students. And I think um, both uh, operations, what Christian Linza did for Machiavelli in, in this book and what Virginia is doing are very, very important because it is important that our experts that have a very clear and deep understanding of these issues then are able to, uh, to explain them to, uh, to us. So um, I'm, I'm going to say a few things about uh, my impressions of, of the book and, and then Virginia is going to uh, go after and then Chris is reading a couple of paragraphs and then uh, commenting. Um, as I said, it's, it's um, un libro di alta divulgazione. First of all, it reads incredibly well. Um, and I think both people who know nothing about Machiavelli and people who know everything about Machiavelli will equally find interesting stuff in this book. The people who know nothing about Machiavelli will see that there is not a single sentence that is not explained or a name that is not put into context. And I think that is very, very important and thinking with my uh, hat as instructor who teaches every now and then a course on Machiavelli, that is incredibly important. We, we take for granted a variety of different things, uh, including that everybody knows about Florentine history, uh, that everybody knows about um, the different uses of the Italian and the Latin. That is one of the topics in which I think um, Christian Linza offers the best insight uh, and observations. So there, there is uh, really literally everything as an explanation and a context. Um, and I believe the, the, mm, the aspects that I found more interesting, somebody like me who reads Machiavelli quite regularly, almost as a breviario like, or as a <laughs> layman uh, book of hours, um, are, are exactly in your assessment of his relationship with Latin. And there are a lot of you know, commonplaces, but Machiavelli sort of disdaining Latin. And, uh, and I believe that the people who think that, uh, mostly based on the famous letter of Machiavelli to Vettori, in which he says that when he goes to the woods, he picks up either Dante or Petrarch or one of these 
minor authors like Ovid or Antipolis. Obviously, Machiavelli is ironic in this, yeah. uh, but there is this commonplace that he was more a man of the vernacular. And indeed, his contribution to the development of uh, the Italian uh, vernacular is, uh, cannot be understated. I mean, his prose is still now surprising, beautiful, elegant. And uh, I, I believe that what you do, being an expert of Renaissance Latin, you, you establish a very close connection between Machiavelli, his own knowledge of Latin, that was not just a working language for him, it was the language that he cherished knew perfectly, loved, and, 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 and of which he, he was under the spell of this language, even if he tries to uh, play it down on some level. Um, and, and I see that in, in different parts of the book, these observations regarding the language uh, and, and his um, depth towards Latin culture comes up um, in, a, in a very brilliant way. And, um, for example, when you talk about the relationship between the theory that would be Roman history and the practice that would be his own experience in politics as secretary of the Florentine Republic. Uh, that dialectic between the things that you learn in books and the things that you learn from experience, the Latin and the vernacular, and the two things being necessary for a better understanding of politics. Um, I found very, very uh, brilliant, your interpretation of the prince as a dialogue or almost as a collection of letters. I've never thought about that in those terms, but it is true. The, 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 the short chapters amount really to the normal length of a letter or of a chapter of a dialogue. It was a very common and um, frequent genre in Renaissance uh, literature. The prince is not a dialogue. Very often it's compared to another genre of um, Renaissance uh, text, that is the speculum principis, uh, that would be sort of a list of qualities that a prince should have, uh, but much less to the idea of a dialogue, because it's written, of course, by one person. There are not interlocutors, at least officially. Uh, but you point out very, very acutely the use of you and I in the prince. And I never paid any attention to it, for example. But it is a sort of a, 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 an attempt of Machiavelli to establish a dialogue, albeit an imaginary dialogue, between himself and his interlocutor, and that remains to be decided who is he writing for. Um, the other important thing that comes up again and again is uh, the question of contextualizing. The whole uh, uh, issue of humanism was providing it context. The Middle Ages read the classical authors, as we know, but instead of reading them in the context, read them with the Christian eyeglasses, interpreting and providing immoral interpretations of them. So it's very important that you constantly provide a context to Machiavelli, uh, warning the reader not to take the word democracy according to our own categories, or the word republic according to our own categories. And that's a temptation that, uh, that uh, occurs very often because we are, we are used to say, oh, Machiavelli is so modern, he, he speaks to contemporaries, and it is absolutely true, but it can be very tricky if because of his modern way of thinking, and we need to define what is modern, and you use a lot the term pre-modern in Machiavelli, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, if you don't contextualize the, the, the words that he uses so carefully, nothing is ever thrown there. It's, everything is, is chosen specifically, but you need to provide a context. And, and you do constantly remind us that the democracy he talks about is not what we have in mind, that uh, the libertà fiorentina is a concept that has very little to do with our own idea of freedom. Um, and I think that uh, that is of fundamental importance in order to avoid major misunderstandings of uh, Machiavelli. And one of the uh, occurrences in which you invite us to contextualize uh, Machiavelli is, of course, regarding gender and women. You know that it's, there is a lot to be, uh, to be said about this. There are old books. Uh, one, uh, Fortune is the Woman, that deals exactly with these issues. Um, 
the misogyny of Machiavelli has been discussed at great length. And I think also in that case you provide not an absolution. You, you do not act as Machiavelli's defense attorney. Uh, you seem to be very aware that he doesn't really need one, even if he has been on the Banco degli Imputati for about 500 years. Um, but you do provide, again, the context in which these things were written and the clear understanding and explanation of his use of words. Um, one of the parts that I found more beautiful in your book is uh, your almost word-by-word -word analysis of the letter of uh, December 10, 1513. To me, that is probably the most beautiful letter of, Itali of the Italian Renaissance. Uh, and maybe you, you can read us some of the letter and some of your own commentary. Um, it's what, again, it's a sort of uh, form of meditation for me, reading that letter every now and then. It's about our own relationship with uh, the classics, but our own relationship with the books we read, um, and between what your daily life is about and what your uh, idea of culture and of elevating yourself could be. So I, I found that, that part brilliant, brilliantly written. Um, and I will stop here. I have a few other questions, but I think I, I mentioned my, uh, the things that impressed me the most. Virginia. So I was, I, I don't know why, I kind of imagined speaking from the lectern. So instead of addressing Chris, I think I'm going to speak, speak out. Probably it's much better. And you, uh, being a, a, a scholar of rhetoric, that's the right thing to do because we have an audience and I kept speaking to Chris and it's good that somebody also addresses the audience. Thank you. So I had um, two great curiosities when I first, when this book first came on my radar, which made me kind of leap at the opportunity to participate in this, in this event when, um, when Stefano asked me to. Um, even though I kind of knew it was going to be the height of the administrative season here at NYU, so not entirely convenient. So one curiosity Stefano's already um, alluded to, which is that um, I've just had my own first experience of attempting to write this kind of introductory book, this book that Stefano mentioned on the a, a short history of the Italian Renaissance. And I found the whole process absolutely Fascinating. I'm dying to compare notes with Chris afterwards. If you've never done it before and you've spent your whole life as a scholar addressing highly specialized books to an audience that uncannily resembles you with exactly <laughs> the same range of knowledge and experience, it's a really very novel and interesting thing to find yourself doing, addressing an audience that's bringing a completely different range of experiences to bear on the subject that you're looking at and we'll probably have a different set of questions to, to ask. It's really quite a kind of liberating sort of voyage of discovery, I think. And one thing that you find is that you're writing in a different sort of persona. You adopt a different um, voice. It's almost like tapping into your inner journalist or something. <laughs> So yeah, having always been a great fan of Chris Chalenza's scholarly work, I was very intrigued to see, you know, what this um, more kind of popular Chris Chalenza would be would be like. And I found it very fascinating to read. And I have to say, to reiterate what Stefano's already said, I think as an introductory book, this this is really quite exemplary. You know, it really manages to to teach you a great deal in a very, very straightforward and accessible way, but with no dumbing down whatsoever. And in fact, one thing that's kind of fun about it is that if you're in the field, you can spot all kinds of moments when you know Chris is kind of addressing issues which are very live in contemporary secondary literature on Machiavelli. And you can sort of it's almost like a game. You can think, yes, I think he's answering <laughs> Virali's point or something like that. And yet, you know, it, it's done with such sprezzatura, to quote um, Machiavelli's famous contemporary Castiglione, that you barely notice this going on. The learning is worn very lightly, even though the learning, I can quite assure you, is absolutely um, there. So as an exercise, it was a fascinating thing to observe. <laughs> 
Another curiosity, my second curiosity approaching this book, which is a very kind of specific one, is that I kind of wanted to see how Chris's book would measure up to the very high standard set by another great introduction to Machiavelli's work, which is that of the political philosopher Quentin Skinner, who was a bit of a mentor of mine at Cambridge. He wrote this book called Machiavelli, A Very Short Introduction, which was published at the beginning of the 80s, I think, and which has become a bit of a classic. And that was always my kind of go-to book when I had to recommend a book on Machiavelli to students or to friends who wanted to get a sense of what Machiavelli was about. So a very hard act to follow, but I was intrigued to see whether Chris, Chris's book could, could follow that act. And I must say, I really felt that on reading it, that it did, that, that I think Chris's book does something completely different from Quentin Skinner's book. It's coming from a different political, a different disciplinary perspective, and it has very, very different emphases. But I think of its kind, it's, it's as good as, as Skinner's work. So I'm now in the position of having to recommend two books, I think, to anyone who wants to learn about Machiavelli. So it's very different in one regard, um, which I think is quite important, which is that whereas historians of political thought or political philosophy tend to, as Skinner did in this book, just discuss Machiavelli's political and diplomatic writings and, and ignore, for example, his comedies, um, Chris's book covers the comic Machiavelli as well as the the serious Machiavelli. It's a much more holistic book. I think the subtitle is, is the clue. It's called Machiavelli, a portrait. And it is really a portrait of Machiavelli as a man, as well as, as a thinker. And it covers you know, every aspect of his thought and writing. And I found that one of the most valuable aspects of the book. It's got a very strong biographical thread. And one thing I liked about the book was it doesn't kind of um, partition off the biography in a chapter at the beginning and then go on to discuss the works. Each of the works which are discussed in order um, are embedded in the particular biographical circumstances from which they grew. And that makes a, for a particularly fascinating story. I think the life and the works are very woven together in a very sophisticated um, way. And also a kind of quite attractively loose way. You get all kinds of digressions, like the, um, the chapter on comedy, for example, has a splendid digression on Machiavelli's sex life and his attitude to, to women, which for me was one of the highlights of the book. And it's very well kind of meshed into. So by the end, you finish up knowing a lot about Machiavelli's life, about his context, and about his, his writings. And for me, one of the revelations of the book, I suppose, was just that it reinforced my sense of what a truly remarkable human being Machiavelli was, and what a strange one. And I think this much more holistic approach to Machiavelli really helps you think about that. I mean, this question may be a bit of a hostage to fortune, but you know, how many countries have their most distinguished political philosopher is also one of their greatest comic playwrights. I mean, I'm sure someone will come up with an example from, you know, <laughs> Latvia or something like that. But I suppose my point is simply that it's not that usual to find these two kind of points of intellectual distinction in the same um, figure. And, um, and it's very, I, I think, maybe the moments that I liked best of all in Chris's book were, were those moments when he was kind of trying to push against what's, what's very often been a compartmentalization of these two aspects of Machiavelli's intellectual trajectory. In a way, Machiavelli encourages this himself at the beginning of his great comedy, The Mandragola, The Mandrake Root, he actually tells us in the proem that you know the only reason why he's writing this lightweight stuff is that you know, circumstances have prevented him from pursuing his vocation as um, a, a, a wise and grave man, um, one saggio e grave, 
or at least he says, a man who wishes to appear sage <laughs> and wise. I, I don't know whether that distinction is important. So there has been a tradition partly coming out of that to kind of compartmentalise the comic Machiavelli and the, the serious Machiavelli. But I really don't think that's the most productive way to, to look at Machiavelli. And I really like the way that, that Chris was putting these two Machiavellis together. At one point, even at the beginning of the chapter on comedy, there was a suggestion which I wish he'd pursued a little bit more, that, that Machiavelli can be seen as having a kind of fundamentally comic sensibility that shows even in his political um, writings. I liked your notion that the downfall of Cesare Borgia could be seen as kind of comic, recounted in a certain, in a certain way. And I loved the ending of the book and the way that that Chris brought up this, he, he had this wonderful quote from a letter of Machiavelli to the historian Francesco Guicciardini from the end of his life, 1525, where he signs off describing himself as historico, comico e tragico. So a historian, a comedian, and a tragedian, or as Chris points out, a historian and a comic and tragic figure. <laughs> He could be saying um, he could be saying either. So yeah, that's what I loved about the book. The only thing, if I had to say, there was something I felt I missed in the book. That's rather ungrateful to say so when there's such a lot in it. Is I'd have liked to see a little bit more about the letters. I mean, the letters are everywhere, and they're quoted all over the place, and you have some wonderful quotations from them. But I kind of almost wish the, the letters had a chapter of their, their own, because I find in my own readings of Machiavelli, I become increasingly convinced that the letters taken together are, in a way, one of his most important and original works alongside Il Principe. And I feel it, it's kind of a tragedy that his work, that his letters aren't better known, particularly among a more, a more general um, public. So I suppose, and I suppose if we were looking for the work among Machiavelli's work that he might have entitled Machiavelli a portrait, <laughs> it would have to be the letters. They are some kind of self-portrait, even if a highly kind of artful and rhetorically self-conscious one. So I suppose there's a kind of concluding question for Chris. I wanted to ask, I suppose not, why didn't you include a chapter on the letters? Because I suspect the answer will be to do with word length and publishers' stipulations and so on. But I suppose since we have the good luck to have you here this evening with us, you know, what might you have said about the letters that you didn't have room to say in the book? And before um, we give the microphone to Chris, I, I forgot to um, remind you in my presentation that very much like Machiavelli, Chris also has a double life as a scholar and a man of action. And he was for four years the uh, director of the American Academy in Rome, a position of great responsibility, a very political position on some level. And uh, he did a terrific job there as he's doing right now as chair of the classics department at Johns Hopkins. I have to say I'm so embarrassed to hear all of these, these kind words said. I want to thank both of you, and I want to thank all of you for coming here to talk about this book. Um, you know, uh, I was very reticent at first to write a book about Machiavelli. I was invited a few years ago to go to the University of Sydney and to do, I had one month off in the summers when I was directing the American Academy in Rome. We were closed only in August, and that of course is their winter semester. So I was invited to go and spend a week at the University of Sydney and be a visiting professor and do about four or five different things, teach a class here, do this here. And one of the things I was asked to do is to do a public lecture on Machiavelli's prints, because at that point it was the 500th anniversary of the composition of the prints. Not, it wasn't print published in his lifetime, but that the 500th anniversary of the composition. And I was very reticent at first because as um, Virginia's pointed out, you know, Machiavelli is in some ways like Dante among scholars, it's like a cult. You know, there are scholars who do only that and that's it. And so they, they read every line and that really wasn't my specialty. My specialty was the century more or less before him, the 15th century, where 
Latin literature flourished and a revival of antiquity flourished on the one hand. But then the more I started to think about it, the more I started to like the idea of just giving it a shot. And the more I realized how embedded, as something Stefano pointed out, that Machiavelli was, in fact, in the 15th century and in these traditions. And the more I read, the more I realized that many people didn't really know um, that he had written comedies, didn't know that he had this vast body of letters behind him, um, didn't know that he had this multifaceted life, didn't know, in fact, really, even though they'd heard the name Machiavelli, and we use the word Machiavellian in our common parlance all the time, that he had this incredibly long and productive period of diplomatic activity. That in truth, the period of his life that he liked the most was this period when he first appears on the historical stage in Florence in 1498 to about 1512 when he goes on over 40 diplomatic missions for the city of Florence. And in fact, just as you were mentioning the letters, there are letters that go back to this period he also sends back to the government of Florence who had charged him to go on these missions, writings that scholars call legations, legazioni. And in them, you actually see a lot of times the the, the little kind of seeds of what will come out later in The Prince. And you see this incredibly active mind who's so proud of his writing skills and who's so interested. He spends time at the, uh, the court, the traveling court of Cesare Borgia, for example, and he writes back. And so the more I start to read about him, the more I realize that it was precisely just interesting to try to put everything into one readable account that would indeed include the comedies, that would have a little bit of letters, though there definitely could have been more, I think that's true. Um, and to try to give a sense of, of who he was in his context. And I do think there are some things that sometimes in Machiavelli's context, we do tend to skip over on occasion or, or are sometimes skipped over in the literature. And one of these aspects has to do with the fact that he does tend to be segmented into different disciplinary areas that don't always match, I think, the kind of life he led and, the, and, and his own outlook on life. Um, language came up in Stefano's discussion. One thing I can say about his language is that it really is this very beautiful, evocative, interesting Italian, but it's a first generation thing too. Um, Machiavelli was heir to this long five generation historical experiment in the 15th century where a whole bunch of Italian humanists, you could argue it goes all the way back to Petrarch who died in 1374, but certainly from the 1430s on, the era of Leonardo Bruni and others who were, some of whom were working at the papal court, they started to ask what sort of Latin did the ancient Romans speak? What sort of language was it? Was it like us today? Did they have to go to school to learn it? Or did they learn it in the house? And as that century wore on, as the 15th century wore on, by the end of the century, they came to believe that ancient Roman had been once, ancient Roman Latin had once been a living natural language, which meant, as you can imagine, the corollary today it was a dead language. And all of a sudden, all of that energy that they had put into studying the syntax of Latin, how, how durable it seemed, and so on, they started to transfer into thinking about Italian. And Machiavelli is heir to that moment. In fact, there's a quotation that I bring up in the book from around 1470 from a professor named Cristoforo Landino who was teaching Petrarch's Italian poetry at the Florentine University at the time. And he says, Whoever wants to be a good Tuscan, meaning a good T Tuscan writer, has to be a good Latin first. Meaning, if you want to write Italian well in the style that's going to be durable and have these attributes about it, you must know Latin first. So Machiavelli, in a way, is bathed in Latin as a youth. We know from his father's book of Ricordi, with whom he studied, just to kind of catch up on who he was, he studied with a guy named Paolo da Ronciglione, who was a, an actually a very important um, teacher of a number of Florentine intellectuals. So he's kind of bathed in Latin as he grows up. And, and, and then all of a sudden, 1498, that's his chance. He has his diplomatic career, and he goes on all of these missions. And it's really only after he has these calamities in his personal life that he's forced to be out of the realm of politics. He keeps writing letters the whole time, wanting to get back in the game somehow, get back into the theater of politics. It's only precisely because he was taken out of the realm of being an active man, an active diplomat, an active politician, that he then begins to write. And I think that's fascinating, because we wouldn't have all of this great stuff of his if he hadn't been imprisoned for a while, and he hadn't been you know, taken out of the game. And so I think that, you know, if you like, Stefano, one thing we could do is, is read this interesting letter from that period Absolutely. and just, you know, hear, hear what happens. Um, there isn't, as Virginia said, there isn't a chapter on the letters, but there is a chapter on la lettera, the right. letter. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this moment when Machiavelli is, uh, he's engaged in correspondence with a number of people, and one of them is this great friend of his named Francesco Vettori, who was an ambassador 
um, to Rome, a Florentine ambassador to Rome. And this is another thing that's hard for us to get our heads around, especially those of us who, who are Americans, to think, well, what was a city-state in that era? You know, what was Florence? And we have to think of it as not just like a city, maybe not as big as a country, but something in between, something that would have its own foreign policy, its own customs, its own dialect, its own currency. So Florence had ambassadors to other places, one of which, of course, was the papal court in Rome. So important a political entity was that. And the interesting court, thing is yeah. that the ambassador of Florence to Rome in this moment was basically an ambassador between an uncle and a nephew. That's right. Because that's the right. Pope was the uncle of the, that's right. the Duke of Urbino. That that's was right. Him. Exactly. That's another thing so that's hard a, for us to a, get our minds around. It's a difficult sometimes. position being <laughs> an ambassador right. between the uncle of the nephew. That's right. But definitely, yeah. Machiavelli yeah. envies him. Yeah, it's like oh, I think right so. in the middle of. The action. He's there. He's in the middle yeah. of the, and that's why he keeps writing him, right? You know, see if you can get me in front of his lordship, right? He says all of these interesting things, right? These letters, and at one point, uh, their correspondence seems to have been interrupted a little bit. And what what happened was the Roman ambassador was busy and he just couldn't write, so he finally sends Machiavelli a letter. And in that letter, the Roman ambassador says, tells him all the things he's been doing, and he's got this busy diplomatic life. Every day is full, right? And then Machiavelli writes him back and writes this letter that becomes, as Stefano says, one of the most famous letters in Western history, and it's a kind of contrast because against, over and against this letter from this Roman ambassador with all his activity and all the kinds of things Machiavelli would have loved to be doing, Machiavelli tells him what he's doing. And so he basically says, I've been sitting on my farm, because he was. He was sort of in this enforced, um, very loose type of house arrest for a while where he had to stay on his own property. He does in uh, Percusina outside of Florence. Um, and he talks about what he does with his, his days, just as Vettori had told him, you know, I do all these active kinds of things. And he tells him what he, Machiavelli writes back and says what he does. And so, you know, he tell, says that for a little while I've been hunting thrushes, birds, and I put a few nets out, but now I'm a little bit tired of that. And then um, as, uh, Stefano mentioned he talks about what he does in the mornings. Machiavelli says, in the mornings I rise with the sun, and I go to one of my woods that I'm having cleared, where I stay for two hours to look over the work done the day before and to spend some time with the woodsmen. They are always in the middle of some argument, either among themselves or with neighbors. So Machiavelli mixes and mingles with all of these people. And that's something that you know, to us maybe is strange. I'm sure to Vettori it wasn't knowing Machiavelli as he did. After I leave the woods, I go to a spring, and thereafter to a place where I hang my bird nets. I have a book with me, Dante or Petrarch, or a minor poet like Tibullus, Ovid, or other ones of that sort. I read about their romantic passions, their love affairs, and I remember my own, taking pleasure for a while in those thoughts. Then I take to the road on the way to the inn. I chat with people who pass by, ask them about the news where they live, learning this and that. And I take note of the diverse taste and imaginings of men. Now here in this letter, one of, one of the things I try to bring out in the book is there's, you know, Machiavelli, I think, I actually believe mistakenly, to get to one of the points about, say, the Quentin Skinner trajectory, I think he's mistakenly considered in the realm of political theory, especially in Anglophone scholarship. I actually think he looks a little bit, he's a proto-something, he's not a proto-political science professor, he's a proto-anthropologist, he loves observing people, he loves seeing what people do and just drawing conclusions um, from what people do. So then he has a meal. Uh, he says, I, I eat whatever there is to eat that this poor farm of mine and my tiny means uh, afford me. Then he goes back to the inn. He says, I find the innkeeper, normally a butcher, a miller, and a couple of kiln workers. I bum around with them for the rest of the day, playing cards and backgammon. And again, we argue. These games lead to a thousand disagreements and endless insults. You have the sense of this Machiavelli who needs human company. He needs give and take. He needs people to argue with him, talk with him, disagree with him. right? And then all of a sudden, the best known parts of this letter occurs. He, this is when he talks about the evening. What do I do at night after this day is over? And he says, once the evening has arrived, I come home and I enter my study. In the entryway, I take off my daytime clothing covered with mud and dirt, and I put on garments that are royal and suitable for a court. Changed into suitable clothes, I step into the ancient courts of ancient men. Received lovingly by them, I nourish myself on that food that alone is mine, for which I was born. There I am unashamed to talk with them and ask them the reasons for their actions, and they, with their humanity, answer me. For four hours I feel no boredom, I forget all worries, I do not fear poverty, and I am not dismayed by death. I give myself to them entirely. So this is the first most famous part, and I would argue that every part of that 
Every word of that letter is important. The first thing he says, he says, I enter into my study. This is sending a signal to Renaissance thinkers. He uses the word scrittoio, but there are other words that they use. Um, in a world where there was privacy was very hard to find, your study, if you were a person who read and wrote, was where you kept your own private books. It's where you kept any little works of art that mattered to you. If you were a businessman, if you were a merchant and you had a study and you took somebody into that study, that was showing you trust them. I trust you. You know, let's sign this contract in my study. So Machiavelli is signaling with this letter that I go into my study. This is the most <coughs> private, intimate place in a world where privacy is hard to find. Um, then he says, you know, another point that comes up in the book is Machiavelli is of, it, it's hard to think about class systems in Florence, you know, middle class, upper class, but what we can say about him is he's not of the normal class of people that would be sent as an official ambassador. He's just below them. So he can be sent, but he actually can't sign treaties. So he can send, he can negotiate, he can talk to rulers, you know, give Florence, uh, Florence's government advice and so on, but he actually can't signed treaties. So he can never be an ambassador. But in this letter, right, he says, I go, you know, I wear royal robes. All of a sudden, he's the same. He's among royalty. Books, in other words, allows you to be among royalty. He says, I nourish myself on that food that alone is mine. The verb he uses in Italian is mi pasco, meaning almost I graze in Italian, this basic word. So this is natural for him, right? This is the most natural thing you can do. And of course, what he means is he's reading works of ancient literature and history. He's reading Livy. Right? He's reading Virgil, he's reading Sallust. Um, he also says, um, the f he says, I'm unashamed to talk with them. Right? So in that same way that normally in his life as a diplomat, he might not be able to talk to everybody in the same way with the ancients, he's unashamed. And then the letter goes on, he says, when, they, when he asked the ancients uh, their, the reasons for their actions, they with their humanity answer me. Now this too, this word humanity is very important. Um, the Italian word is humanita, the Latin word, which is in the back of his mind, I would argue, is humanitas. And this is a word, and I can read you a passage here, that had a lot more to do than just a distinction between people and animals. Um, one thinker, for example, an ancient thinker who was well known in the Renaissance, Aulus Gellius, put it this way. He said, humanity meant, and I quote him here, something like what the Greeks called paideia, and what we mean when we speak of education and initiation into the liberal arts. Cultivation and learning in this type of knowledge has been given to man alone from among all animate beings and is therefore called humanity. So learning, and specifically learning in the liberal arts, gave one the quality of humanitas. And for Machiavelli, it's this quality that the ancient authors he loves so well possess. Then comes probably the most famous passage to scholars of this letter. Let me read this passage to you too. Machiavelli says, because the, the letter goes on to his friend, because Dante says that one does not possess knowledge without retaining what one has understood, I have jotted down what I have profited from in their conversation, that is the conversation with the ancients, right, the books he's been reading, and I've composed a short work, De Principatibus, right, on Princeton, he uses the Latin there, where insofar as I can, I delve in and I do some thinking about this subject, discoursing on what a princedom is, what sorts of princedoms there are, how they are acquired, how they are maintained, and why they are lost. And if ever any of my musings have pleased you, this one, I think, will not incur your displeasure. And it should be received by a prince, and especially by a new prince, but I dedicate it to the magnificence of Giuliano de' Medici. Filippo Casavecchia has seen it, and he can inform you, at least in part, about the thing itself and about the thoughts I've shared about it with him, even as I continually enlarge and polish it. Now, this letter um, has, that part of the letter has drawn scholars' attention for many reasons. First of all, obviously, it gives us a clue as to the dating, at least of the first part of The Prince. What he seems to be talking about there is the first 11 chapters of The Prince, which in that work represent a kind of typology of different princedoms, what sorts there are. So some scholars have said The Prince was composed in two phases. This letter marks phase one, and it's nice, right, because we have a date so we can know precisely when it was. That's one way to look at the letter. Another way to look at this letter overall, and this is why I would argue, and I do argue in the book that the letter can actually be misleading to modern years, is think about the image the overall letter presents or can present of Machiavelli if you want to read it in a certain way. A person alone puts on royal robes, goes into his study, communes with the ancients, very intimate, totally solitary, writes, comes out with a completed work. It's an image that could almost come out of the romantic 19th century. Right, you think of like Caspar David Friedrich looking over the mountain, you know, alone, right? And, and so, it, and it's appealing, I think, because of that to modern ears. But I would argue that you must, one must understand Machiavelli, read the whole passage, read what he writes, because he also makes sure to say that he shared it with a friend. 
you know, this, this friend is a relatively minor figure, Filippo Casavecchi, but he tells him, I've been sharing this piecemeal with this friend, and he can update you on where I am and what I'm doing, and how I continually revise it. So far from having, you know, an author who went to a study alone and came out with a perfectly finished jewel of a work, instead we have somebody who really saw the essence of creation of literature as conversation, as having to be shared with someone else. I share my thoughts with you today. You tell me, well, I agree with that, but I don't agree with this. I go back to my study, I rewrite. And I think that when you look at the rest of his work too, his famous discourses on Libby and other things, they're almost all like that. They're little bits of things that then he puts together in very artful ways. But I feel that they have this conversational kind of aura. So anyway, that's what the letter I would say on that front meant to me, and I appreciate the chance to, you know, discuss it with you. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, and maybe we can open the uh, conversation with the public, but before I have yeah. one, one question. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you repeat in, in the book is that the prince is a job application, and you said it now. Uh, it's basically a way for Machiavelli to let uh, the people in power know that he's yes. available, yes. he's ready, he has the skills, yeah. the knowledge, mm -hmm. and the will to yeah. help out, yeah. make Florence stronger, big, or Rome, because yeah. he was also ready Happy to serve to the papal court. Yeah, that's yes. right, yeah. um, as we know, there are two main school of thoughts when it comes to the interpretation of, of the prince, and one, of course, is exactly what yeah. uh, Chris says, and the other one is the so-called oblique interpretation. Yeah. Um, the oblique interpretation, very uh, simply put, is, uh, well, Machiavelli, is writing these things, how you become a prince, not for a prince who is already there and knows how to become a prince. He's writing it for the people who are not princes, who do not have access to power, who are not informed of the mysteries of power, the Arcana Imperi, and basically is revealing to yeah. the uh, people that are not in power what power is about. And of course, the highest peak yeah. in this uh, interpretation of Machiavelli is with the Italian Romanticism and the process of Italian Unification, the Risorgimento, and Ugo Foscolo, one of the greatest Romantic poets in Italy, um, buried in the Basilica of Santa Croce yes. next to Machiavelli, yes. um, <laughs> celebrates Machiavelli saying uh, he's the one that revealed of which blood and tears the scepter and the crown of the kings yes. drip. And, and uh, yeah. so it's this turning upside down of things. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah. He didn't write it for the prince. The prince doesn't need to know these mm -hmm. things. Right. He's writing for the, for the others. You don't mention this thing. And of course, yeah. it's something probably That's that true. is more relevant to an Italian yes. readership because yes. it's one of the founding myths yes. of, of, of uh, unified Italy, yeah. along with the last chapter yeah. of the prince that you discussed. Uh, sure. People are still revised, uh, reviving that, that yes. thesis even now, though. I mean, um, I was given a... Um, book manuscript to read recently mm -hmm. that was just pure Foscolo. Yeah. Foscolo. In the interpretation of Machiavelli. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, look, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that um, a few things, though, I think have to be kept in mind. The first is, is this. Um, it often surprises modern readers that neither prints, nor the discourses on Livy, nor the Florentine histories were print published in Machiavelli's lifetime. Right. So, so you know, the only major work of political theory-ish type things that he print publishes is the Art of War. He also had published early on the, his Decenale, which is his account in Terza Rima, Dante's meter of the events from 1494 to 1504, and it's print published in 1506. So we know he kind of knows what printing is about, and that's why I would argue that I think that. Uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear that he did try to put the prince in front of, you know, Lorenzo de Medici, because of course the dedicate changes between the time of this letter and, um, and I think he really felt that he had one thing he could offer, and that was his mind and his pen together, right? This entity, and so I think he would have been happy to serve a prince. I think he would have been happy to serve the papal court. This is what strikes me about him. I don't really see in him um, a kind of heroically. Uh, sort of Boy Scout style, sincere theorist. I see somebody who really believes that you have to have civil servants, and he wants to be a civil servant. He wants institutions. He wants stability. So, it, you know, in the context of a princedom, you know, if you read the prince carefully, right, he says in his chapters on flatterers and how they should be avoided, a prince has to have good advisors. 
meaning you have to have civil servants, people who care about lo stato. Now, if those lo stato is embodied in the prince, they still have to be people who want to support the prince and not tear him down. They have to be modest, but they have to be smart, all those qualities. And of course, in the discourses on Livy, you know, the book's about republics. He's a Florentine. He likes republics. And so there's a way in which there's also this sort of ideal um, of a possible republic there. But I, I do think for him what he really wants, um, or, or at least what you can draw out of him, um, is the contrary of what he sees around him. Because what he sees is instability. And that's the interesting thing. So I mean, I think what we can draw out of him is institutions, but not so much you know, a kind of heroic anti-prince person as that oblique interpretation would give us, and not so much either really, I, you know, a kind of confirmed Republican political theorist the way, you know, one has read him in, in other contexts. I think, you know, you have to read him in his life and in his context, and I think they're just there. All of these elements are there. It's shocking really, you know, that Machiavelli, I mean, the great thinker Isaiah Berlin said that, you know, for somebody who is universally praised, as Machiavelli is, for his clarity, because he is clear, he's a very clear writer. It's amazing how many different interpretations there have been of him, right? Because we read into him what we want to see, right? We read into him what we want to read, and so, uh, but I appreciate it. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's an important element of the discussion, yeah, so. I really like the fact that you were so insistent on the fact that Machiavelli isn't a systematic political thinker. He's not a theorist. I like the fact that you said um, his only kind of consistent theoretical position is that military power is absolutely at the root of any kind of political regime. That corresponded exactly to what I feel. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, right. We don't normally think of him that way. We don't, norm we don't normally think of political theory that way. I think we think of political theory as create a constitution of some sort or a plan and then culture will match the plan. But as we see in real life, that doesn't always happen, right? Mm -hmm. You can create plans and people and their cultures don't always fit into those plans. But, but he's clear, clear as a bell on the military issue. I think that's right. Yeah. And the other issue that you were mentioning, stability. Yes. When it, when it comes to deciding, so what is the final contribution that, that Machiavelli brings to uh, the world yeah. of politics? It's this really quest for stability. Yeah. And when you talk about this with the students, they seem quite disappointed. So, so also all the fuzz is about stability. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Machiavelli wants stability. Right. But it is so important, and you prove it, because as, as Virginia said, it's so intertwined with his, with his biography. Mm -hmm. As a nine years old, probably, he witnessed the, the, yeah. the Pazzi yeah. conspiracy sure, sure, yeah. and the aftermath of the yeah. Pazzi conspiracy. Yeah. You know, there were yeah. bodies dragged through the yes. city of Florence yeah. and chopped into pieces yeah. and thrown into the yeah. Arner. And, yeah. uh, that brought back no, it's and amazing. blood yeah. in the streets. Yeah. So, and constant, these constant changes, and then when the French arrive, and, yeah. uh, and the execution of Savonarola, yes. uh, hanged yeah. and burned in yeah. the Piazza della Signoria. Yeah. So, when you think about the life experience of this man uh, between the age of reason and his 30s, yes. he had seen all sorts yes. of uh, incredibly yeah. violent mm -hmm. deeds that we normally do not associate with Florence and the Renaissance. You know, yes. most people think of Botticelli, La Venere, yes. and everybody was right. wearing right. veils right. and right. throwing flowers. Yeah. And the, it, no, it was pretty horrible, and people killed each other yeah. in the streets. And yeah. and he witnessed that, mm -hmm. and um, and therefore stability yes. becomes a paramount value, even when it seems that he is willing to compromise what could be one of his major yes. uh, beliefs yeah. for stability. If you consider his biography as you do, it makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think that um, a lot of times, you know, given that Machiavelli speaks to us so viscerally and he's so alive for us, I think sometimes we almost think that Machiavelli was born from the head of Zeus. You know, he just was fully formed, had no... But one interesting trajectory of recent scholarship that's been going on about the 15th century, the century before Machiavelli, is in history writing. And one argument that people are making now is that to look for what the political theory was before him, you have to look not so much at treatises that called themselves political treatises, things precisely like the Speculum Principis tradition or other things, you have to look at what people were writing as histories. And then Machiavelli starts to make a little more sense, including a work we haven't talked about yet, his Florentine histories, because he writes, he, he wins a contract from the University of Florence in the 1520s to write an official history of Florence. And 
What that history does, it's the first one of, of this new genre of writing history along ancient models that's in the vernacular and not in Latin, so it's interesting in that way. Um, but it's also um, full of exemplary tales of people. And so precisely this idea of stability, one of the things that he talks about in the Florentine histories, he says, I, mine is different from the ones that have come before. I read the ones of the famous humanist chancellors of the 15th century. I read Poggio Bracciolini, I read Leonardo Bruni. He says, they're very good on talking about when Florence was at war with somebody else and so on, but they never really talk about conflict within Florence. And this is what he sees. You know, you think, think in your mind, for example, of a postcard view of the city San Gimignano and those towers that you see, right? And think probably the real San Gimignano in the Middle Ages probably had two or three times as many. People are building those towers in the Middle Ages because noble families were fighting with each other in the streets and killing each other in the streets. And so I think what he's trying to do and what this generation or before him are trying to do and they're right, doing history writing, they're trying to show people habits. So it's a soft political theory. It's not a political theory of rules, of constitutions. It's a political theory of, you know, um, you know, um, uh, look at Corso Donati, who in whatever year it was, you know, he had taken power but then, you know, he basically got too big for his britches. You know, he started having his own army. He started threatening people, so he was killed in public. You know, look at Walter of Brienne, who is this so-called Duke of Athens, okay. who takes power in Florence in the mid, early to middle 14th century. Machiavelli talks about this in his Florentine histories. At first, people wanted him because they wanted stability. But then all of a sudden, he started doing things like, you know, he had somebody's tongue cut out because the person spoke against the regime. And, you know, we Florentines are always used to being able to speak our minds, so people got angry at that. And, oh, he was French, and he started bringing in other of his French friends, and then they started, you know, committing adultery with our women. And we don't like that either. And so all of a sudden, Walter Brienne comes to this bitter end, and he's, you know, he's killed. And so I think, in a sense, also Machiavelli wants stability in, say, Florence's relations with the outside world, but he also wants stability within the walls. And that's what he sees looking at his work of Florentine history, the one he writes, is this profoundly negative work. I mean, in a way, it's this story of abject failure, you know? Like it's a very bold thing, because he's dedicating it to a pope, he's dedicating it to Pope Clement VII, you know? who's a Medici, and yet Machiavelli basically tells this story of time after time, Florence, but also Italy as well, always giving up and doing the things it shouldn't be doing. You know? and, and so it's, it's, he really gets very critical by then. He does it in a very subtle way, and not in such a way that you know, anybody would, you know, a dedicatee could be offended by it. But I think the message is there. So stability, I think that's what he really wants. And he wants to give people maybe not so much rules, but habits of how to get it. You know? Thank you. I'm going to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Was, uh, was Machiavelli a sociopath? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the question is, was Machiavelli a sociopath? Oh, man. Who wants to take I that? Said, <laughs> I said you're not his defense attorney, but you're going to take this. Okay, I'm going to take this one? Okay. Um, no, no, I don't think so. I think he's a profoundly human person, but I think he... Um, no, I don't think so. But I think he had just seen so much that he was just writing down what he saw in a lot of ways. I don't know that he's necessarily even recommending courses of actually, let's say, The Prince, the work we know best that is often replete with these examples. I think, I think he's just a human being who saw all these things, and, and both in his real life and in the reading he did in antiquity, and he just put them out there. I do think, though, if you talk about his character a little bit, if not a sociopath, he's tactless. He doesn't have the right, am right amount of tact. He's always doing these little things that are almost on the border of offending people. For example, when he's in this diplomatic career of his, right, you know, from 1498 to 1512, one of his responsibilities is to go out to various places outside of Florence, right back to the Florentine government. Okay, this is what's going on. This is what you guys should do. <laughs> Half of these legations, when you read them, contain these veiled insults, like, well, I know you'll never want to do my recommendation because you're so stupid and you haven't done it before, but still, let me just tell you what you should do. He doesn't quite say it that way, but you realize the tone is really this kind of nagging tone that he does all the time. So you realize that's not someone who necessarily is going to rise up in a bureaucracy all the time, right? So he, but yet, you know, he, he does reach this height for a while, but so, so he does have a very particular character, let's put it that way. Um, but of all the, uh, Virginia, Correct me if I'm wrong. Of all the authors of Italian literature, I think he's the less, the least sociopathic of all. I mean, <laughs> think of the other ones. I mean, you have Roberto Tasso, and you have, uh, I mean, Dante himself. I mean, there, there were there were people that, from a 
social point of view, had problems. It, I think Machiavelli is probably the character with whom we would have all loved to go out to dinner. He, to he would be top of my yeah. list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been hilarious, actually. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the I think as well, I mean, you were presumably thinking of some of his more unsavory um, moral rec recommendations in Il Principe, but one of the most revealing, it's not very well known, but a really revealing piece of research on, on Machiavelli. It's by a scholar in, in Britain called Brian Richardson, who looked at the immediate reception of Il Principe. It did circulate in manuscript. No one was even faintly shocked by anything Machiavelli said. You know, they comment on, on the political prescriptions. They don't say a thing about the morality. They don't say this is shocking or outrageous. And I think, you know, if Machiavelli was a sociopath, so was most of the Florentine <laughs> political caste at that point. And we, we have to add that the whole moral reading of, of the prince came with the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. I always tell my students Machiavelli was the first victim of the religious wars of the 16th century. I mean, he was dead, but uh, he really fell victim of these huge contrast, and he was seen by the Catholic, as you also mentioned in your introduction, as a sort of uh, uh, proto-Protestant, uh, uh, calling into question, bringing the, 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 the authority, and by the Protestants as the quintessential example of Catholic cunningness and yeah. Jesuitism. <laughs> so in both cases, he, he, and, and, and the prince falls in the middle, and I it's think condemned, but you know, the, the anti-Machiavelli is born in Innocent Gentile, who is a French Huguenot, and uh, and then of course there are all the Jesuits who write against him. So he fell victim of, of both fires. On, on both I think sides. printing didn't help though. After no. 1532, the yeah, book was getting exactly. into all kinds of hands of people who Machiavelli probably wouldn't have and, addressed. And sometimes it having more circulation than it would have otherwise, paradoxically, by being translated into Latin. Only real international, you know, kind of language at the time. So, I saw there was a question. Yes, uh, uh, it's been a long time since I've read the print, and you know, even longer uh, that I've read any portion of the discourses. But you said something uh, that uh, evoked a memory uh, about uh, his not writing rules, and my recollection strongly is that he offered anecdotes yep. as evidence and from that what would you say about his being a pragmatist as opposed to uh, an ideologue, uh, yep. somebody that uh, yep. I'd like to hear what you have to say. No, I, th that's a great question because I do think it, it takes the two poles of this big tension in his thought. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, on the surface, there's no doubt about it. I mean, he's a pragmatist, he's a realist, he wants to get things done because he's had to get things done. I mean, you know, what, it, as you probably know, you know, if you're ever on the inside of an institution, it never looks the same as it does from the outside. You just realize you've got to get some things done and you have to, you know, make choices and things like that. And he had done this work of diplomacy and so on. And so a lot of the things that he will recommend are quite pragmatic. Um, you know, everything from, I mean, he's an, a, a literal pragmatist, to give you an example. One of the triumphs in his life is he organizes a Florentine army, actually. He gets 5,000 soldiers and he writes rules. And if you read his rules, it's not just theory. It's sort of like, well, these many men should go here, these many should go I mean, he really has rules and orders and he has rituals that he creates for them and so on. So he's a total pragmatist. And what strikes me, though, on the other level, this sort of idealist level, is I think that there are times, though, <coughs> last chapter of The Prince would be one, which you mentioned, very end of the dialogue, The Art of War, um, where a kind of idealism comes in, like if only there were somebody who come, could come and do all of these ideal things, right? Or in the discourses on Libya, if only there were an ideal kind of constitution or system of government. So I think it's there, the idealism is there, but I think probably the bulk of him is this pragmatic, uh, you know, results-oriented person. There's a famous passage, again, my memory, uh, where he writes about uh, the need for a ruler to give stability to prevent the death and the privation in Italy that's moving back and forth. That's very, very mo moving. Yeah. And at the same time, he's over, to me anyway, he was overwhelmingly uh, pragmatic. Yeah. There's sort of a tension, as you say. I think that's right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Me? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Um, would it be correct to say that Machiavelli set the basis for the principle of separation of church and state or faith and governance? Is it, uh, the question is about whether uh, is it correct to say that Machiavelli uh, laid the basis, the foundation for the concept of separation of church and state? Mm -hmm. You speak about that in, yeah. in your book, yeah. and I think you, you I mean, do it very well, clarifying Machiavelli's position vis-a-vis -vis religion, and yeah. you distinguish his position towards the Vatican, his yes. position towards yeah. Catholicism, his position towards Christianity. Yeah. And there are three completely different things. They're different things. He doesn't like any of them, <laughs> but for different reasons. Yeah. You know, I think there's a way in which you, you, could, you could say that in a long way, that, which is to say that I think a lot of things with Machiavelli in his era, he's part of what becomes elements in a very long genealogy. So it's like one strand of the DNA is there, if you see what I mean. So when it comes to religion, for example, you know, he has a number of different ways of thinking about it. On the one hand, in his discourses on Libya and in his Florentine histories, he has a basic position about the Catholic Church, which is that what he calls an ecclesiastical principality, meaning the Pope, the papacy, is a very strange form of government, governance, right? Um, and he says that the popes in the history of Italy have had a history of never quite being powerful enough to unify the whole peninsula on the one hand, but being powerful enough to have and to want power over a certain amount of land and governance and so on. And so to maintain their power, they're always bringing, making alliances, maybe with other Italian city-states, or they're always bringing foreigners in. And then as soon as the foreigner comes in, the foreigner gets power, the pope gets anger and resentful, and he can scheme to somebody else and wants to get him out. So in a way, they're this source of disorder and instability and this kind of thing. So I do think that, you know, and remember, too, I mean, Italy is marked by this very interesting and strange history, right, where, you know, the seat of international Christendom which only until recently, you know, has been quite important, you know, I mean, like, it was there. And so people see the underbelly, they see the inside of it. Machiavelli's friends with people who work at the papal courts, so you can see the insides of things in ways that you might not otherwise. And then when it comes to Christianity, that's a whole different thing. I mean, when Christianity, he, he praises what he perceives as ancient Roman religion, because for him, religion is not so much about... He's not a very spiritual guy, if you see what I mean. He's not a, you know, and so for him, really, religion is about public ritual. It's about the way religion structures your life because of those things you do regularly. And it's about the sort of habits that religion gives you depending on what sort of religion it is. So for him, his version of ancient Roman religion is that it was, you know, full of blood sacrifices, you know, sacrificing animals, and those sacrifices were ferocious, and they made the men ferocious who saw the sacrifice, and they made them want to go out and be ferocious and conquer enemies and do things and win glory and have earthly glory. And that's what ancient Roman religion was about. It was a civic religion. That's what we would call it today. He doesn't use those terms. Whereas the problem with Christianity, in his view, and he says this overtly, is that our religion has taught men only the strength to suffer. Right, so to suffer martyrdom because, you know, ever since Augustine, he doesn't reference Augustine, but ever since Augustine, right, lives 354 to 430, there's been this idea that, you know, there's this world, but then there's this other superintending world, which is better. It's the one we'll go to eventually. You know, whatever happens in this world can't really be of importance compared to that other world. And that's something that doesn't sit well with Machiavelli, I think. You know, he just, he, he wants, you know, again, the pragmatic thing, he wants results now. And so he doesn't feel that the religion is helping things. And he uses also a gender category to define oh, yeah. Christianity vis-a-vis -vis the Roman religion. Yeah. He says that Christianity is the religion that effeminated. Yes, the, yes, it, it's made the society as effeminate. opposed to the male religion that's of, right. of the yeah. Romans. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that's very right. interesting that how he inserts yeah. like a, a gender. It's there, definitely. I agree with that, yeah. Yes? I don't know if they have televisions in hell, but what do you think Machiavelli would enjoy most about American national life <laughs> oh, man, that's interesting. You know, it's, have you, did you ever, you know, there was this novel recently that won a, a prize of some sort, and I forget the author's name, but it was called Billy Flynn's Halftime Walk. Have you heard of this novel? It just came out. Anyway, I, I just can't believe I'm not remembering the author's name now, but it won a prize. Anyway, in this novel, basically what it does, it takes place on one day, and it tells the story of four or five American soldiers who've just come back from somewhere, like Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere, and, and I think they're in Dallas, and they have to be presented at halftime at the football game. All right, now, if you've ever gone to an American sports event recently, um, you know, I go regularly to baseball games when I'm back in Baltimore, and, you know, I mean, there's always this very solemn, civic, religious thing. You stand up, and people have their hands on their hearts, and it really, that's what Machiavelli meant. 
right? That's what he meant. He meant a, a secular but religious ritualistic thing. No sports you know, element can start without that. And now, especially with these sort of wars that are going on, there's often even more, you know, that, that's true, you know, salute to the troops at halftime, things like that. I mean, none of that in theory should have much at all to do with sports, right? But it sort of does, and it sort of is religious, and it's sort of ritual. It's not, it's not religious religious, but it's kind of a ritual. So I do think that would have been something that he would have been fascinated by because it's so gigantic and huge and like all pervasive when you go to these sort of games. Um, Man, I don't know what to tell you about the rest of American life. I, I will say, though, you know, look, I will say this. I think he would see, though, that, um, that uh, what he would probably say is what he says in the Prince in his chapter on fortune, which is that fortune is like a raging river and that the responsibility of leaders is to build up the embankments when the river isn't flooding. Um, and, and, you know, and the way I would culturally translate that to our moment is to work together about reasonable things that everybody can agree on and stop just never getting anything done in American politics, right? Everybody can agree on infrastructure. Everybody agrees bridges are crumbling, stuff like that, right? You can get that done, Republicans, Democrats, but somehow, because it's evolved in this way that nobody can agree with anything. And I think he would probably say, you know, you're, you're sowing the seeds of your own ruin because you have a chance now and it's easy and there are certain things you can run and you're not doing it. So you, I think he would probably say that. Stephen. Yes. Um, of the leaders of the world of today, yeah. so from President Obama to Vladimir Putin, yeah. the Iranian president, who do you think should read uh, tonight? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. My book or, or Machiavelli? Your, 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 your book is the story of Machiavelli. Right. So maybe oh, they we, should all read it. We <laughs> should <laughs> each get two copies. Yeah. Yeah. Really, you know, I think it should be. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know what I will say, though? You know, if you think of Putin, Putin, there is this chapter in The Prince where Machiavelli talks about Pope Julius II. And, he, and he's talking about, you know, what is it, how, you know, heck, there's you know, ideas that run throughout The Prince, you know, how can an what sort of power does an individual have? How can you combat fortune and so on? And he talks a lot about people having different natures. So Julius II is this warrior pope, you know, first decade or so of the 16th century. And at one point, Machiavelli tells the tale of Julius II you know, needing to get into the city or conquer the city of Bologna, right? He gets to the gates, and Julius II leads an army himself, gets on a horse. The Pope gets on a horse, and everybody was so blown away by this. You know, the French were just like, oh my God, what is this, the Pope? <laughs> that, that luckily, you know, he won, but he won because of his impetuousness. Um, and, you know, had his nature been different, had he, you know, had, had the moment not required impetuousness, he would have failed, Machiavelli says. You know, or had his nature been not an impetuous nature, but that of a cautious man, he wouldn't have been able to do it. But the moment and his nature coincided. So, you know, Putin, Ukraine, you just do it. You just jump right in and do it. And everybody was just sort of shocked. And they thought, well, what do we do? And he just did it. Right? He just sort of, you know. So probably everybody should read something of Machiavelli's just to get a sense of, you know, how political reality works, because I think he was right. It's always these moments, you know, what Machiavelli calls the occasione, which is really to the Latin occasio, which is from the Greek kairos, meaning a moment, but, but, but not just any moment, the right moment, then you have to jump on it, right? Um, so that's what I would say. Yes? Um, we were talking about contemporary things. I wasn't going to ask this, but the more you talk about Machiavelli, I was trying to come up with someone contemporary or within modern times. Yeah. George Kennan keeps coming to my mind. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. A public servant, yes. not a decision maker, but wanting to be an advisor, yeah. fascinated with anthropology and the way people behave, not yeah. being a theorist so much as a pragmatic yeah. public sort. And I'm just fascinated with the similarity of the yeah. personalities. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I did. I will say I got to know in a way I never had before a lot of um, foreign service officers when I was in Rome because we had links with the embassy. And you know, I met tons of these people from the low to the high. You know, we were luckily we had two very friendly American ambassadors because it mattered for the American Academy in Rome to have the ambassadors, and we both we actually knew them both. But even all the way down the line, cultural attaches, things like that. And it was pretty shocking to meet this type of person who every three years, not so much the ambassadors, because those are usually political appointments, but the rest of them, all the rest, all the way up to the DCM, the deputy chief of mission is the second in command. These are people who every three or four years pick up and leave and go somewhere else because they're serving the interests not of a particular 
political party. They're serving the interests of the U.S. and whoever you know the commander in chief is at that moment. And so that was interesting to me because that gave me a little bit more insight, I think, into what Machiavelli might have had in mind and what makes him make sense. What makes this desire he has after his what he calls you know post res perditas after his calamities, you know, to still get back into government because he, he always does. He weaves his way and he never reaches the heights he had in his diplomatic career. But even up until the end of his life, there's always one little mission he's being sent on. He gets sent on something. So he was trying to get back into that political life. Um, yeah. yeah. How would you define the term Machiavelli? Or what would you want us to understand? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. How would you define the term Machiavellian? I would define it um, based on all of his works and all of his life. Not cherry picking one theory or one, one work that seems to match the things that we like. And I think, again, if you look at the whole course of his life, um, what he wanted most in political life was participants. He thought noisy democracies were good democracies. He thought there should be public space where people have time to, you know, opportunity to vent their, you know, their, their disagreements. So Machia real Machiavellianism to me is, is that. It's this idea of not so much doing what I think is sometimes the habit of intellectuals, we professors sometimes, to think of the world in such a way that even implicitly we're saying, well, if we could just destroy the whole world as it is and recreate it according to our abstract principles, this is how it would be. Instead, realizing, okay, we have some institutions, they're actually not that bad, they're pretty good, and let's work on making the institutions as they are better, if you see what I mean. That's what I would say. Yeah. Yes? Did Machiavelli believe in the idea of democracy, the way we envision democracy today as a participation of Masses, yeah. or really more in a democracy of the elite. I, I think he wouldn't have even understood our, our our drive toward universal enfranchisement throughout his work. Every almost in every one of his works and in his letters, by the way, he says, you know, there are always going to be these. He, he uses a medical metaphor of his time. He calls them humors. You know, there's this theory of the humors. There's always going to be these two humors, right? That the powerful want to oppress, and the people who are not powerful want not to be oppressed. And he sort of believes this is fixed in society. And I think something about our modern conceptions of democracy are maybe more utopian than that. You know, the idea that even people who are very, very disenfranchised somehow can be, become more enfranchised or, you know, this kind of meritocratic idea. So I don't know that he would have recognized that idea. I just, I don't know, maybe yeah, and, and then you would disagree. Well, something that also you remember in your book is that uh, when we think about the Florentine Republic and we think that there were these officials that would stay in Palazzo Vecchio for two months, yeah. The longer you stay, the more prone you are to be corrupted. So two months is the maximum you can stay. Um, nobody voted for them. They were not elected. They were they were casted. The names were in leather bags, and you had to qualify to be uh, in one of those yeah. bags. Yeah. And every two months, they would uh, take from the bag. So it's not at all democracy as we intend it yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, you had to qualify. To qualify, you had to be um, not to have any debt to anybody. Yeah. And uh, paid your taxes. Paid your and then, taxes. of course, there were all sorts of things with the Medici were wonderful in knowing what was going on in those leather bags. Yeah, making sure the right <laughs> yeah. <the> right <laughs> bags. But, you know, very different yeah. from our idea of democracy. Democracy is based on, on, on casting uh, names. Oh, but, yeah. And if we have to, in, in these um, historical and political panorama, it's it seems almost a paradox, but the one that gets closer to the idea of modern democracy is Girolamo Savonarola. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, He's the one who bring. opens yeah. up uh, yeah. the, the yeah. terms of representation. Yeah. Uh, basically, all the head of family of Florence almost uh, directly participated yeah. in, the, right. in the political yeah. life. He creates a special hall in the Palazzo Vecchio yeah. called Salone dei Cinquecento. Yeah. 500 people for yeah. a city like Florence. Yeah. Basically, every family has uh, a representative as a senator. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we are used to think uh, you know, he's another great yeah. Yeah. <laughs> character right, right. that, of course, emerges in your book. But um, you know, there are so many the, all the myths regarding some or other fire of the, of the vanities. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the concept of democracy, he's the one that thinks, for example, that God manifests Himself in the voice of the people, and therefore you have to give yeah. voice to the people. Right. You know, it's a sort of Theocracy, democracy, right. but and it has followers, right? Even yes. after he dies, right? There's a Savonarola party that's active in Florence that wants precisely there are these kind of dueling, mm -hmm. dueling republicanisms, dueling mm -hmm. theories of democracy. One is this sort of broader Savonarola, one, and the other one is this narrower one. 
and and that fight goes on right afterwards. But and so on, finally, the idea that of course all uh, Christian theology went in the direction of monarchy as yeah. a monarchy tempered by yes. advisors and by some sort of consultant. So in order not to get in trouble theologically, then he gets in trouble from a disciplinary point of view. Uh, he says, I'm talking about Florence. Yes. I'm not talking in general about what's the best form of government, but knowing the Florentines, yes. they are much better off with the democratic form of government than with the oligarchic yes. or with the monarchical form of government. But uh, from a political point of view, uh, there is the defense of democracy uh, closer to what we would now define democracy, I think comes from him. There's, even, there's a fascinating bit of research by Bill Kent, I think, that shows that Savonarola at one point even considers involving women in the political yes. process to, to at least talk about He was very the savvy because women. many women were among his followers. So he knew that if women had had the vote, he yeah. probably would have won. Well, exactly. Large that, margin. that initiative is actually quashed by a couple of powerful yeah. women who don't want women to be involved in <laughs> politics. Because of that irrationality. <laughs> <laughs> yes, last question there. Oh, yes. Well, from time to time, McEvenly uh, talks about uh, uh, what he calls I Grandi. Yeah. And I have a few questions uh, about I Grandi. First, what is McEvenly's definition of I Grandi? Yeah. How, what does he think a prince should do to deal with I Grandi? And what would he say about uh, some grandi in our society who can buy a presidential candidate or who can buy all of the votes in a Senate? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the question is, you know, Machiavelli uses this term, i grandi, and he means by it, you know, the, the sort of the highest echelon of society or the people who, what I think he really means, actually, if, if you were to ask me what I mean, I think what he means is, we would use modern terminology, modern scholarly terminology, the people who in the social memory of a city are the most upper echelon people, right? So these are the people with old family names and so on. This is what Machiavelli means, um, I think, by uh, I Grandi. And he contrasts uh, at one point in his Histories of Florence the ways that the ancient Romans dealt with the conflict between I Grandi Right, the people in these higher echelons and the people, and the way the Florentines dealt with this con um, conflict. And he says that for the Romans, what the Romans wound up doing, and if you read Livy, it's true, there's this phenomenon that scholars call the conflict of the orders, where there's always, you know, people, you know, there's people who are um, traditional Rome, old Roman senatorial families, but then there's people maybe who went out and won a battle, or they're merchants and they have more wealth, they want a seat at the table. So there's always this conflict for enfranchisement. And what Machiavelli says is that by the end, after it all worked out, the Romans um, had an inequality that worked for them, meaning that they came to terms with the idea that there are going to be some people, these older families, but then there are going to be other people who want representation too, and they found ways to do it. Florence, he criticizes because he says that, on the other hand, the Florence, uh, Florentines came up with a, he says, a mirabile uguaglianza, uh, a wondrous, and I think he's being a little sarcastic here, equality. Meaning that, you know, the Florentines tried in the 1290s in what they called the Ordinances of Justice to eject from governmental participation all of the people who were these old families. But of course they're still there, they still have wealth, they still have estates, they can still do things, they can still cause problems. So I think for Machiavelli, what he would want to see again in an ideal world is some form of government that could ensure stability where enough people felt they had a voice at the table. Um, you know, as to the second question of what he would think now, this is, it's, it's hard to say, right? I mean, we're in a new world now with uh, um, American democracy and, and the ways that you know, a very, very small percentage of people can not just influence elections with money, but influence elections in parts of the country that they don't live in, that they have nothing to do with, right? I mean, that's a new, but it's a, it's a, this is a new world that we're in now, so I don't know what he would say, I don't know if you Re Regarding the, the yeah. choice of terminology, that is a very, very uh, acute observation, he uses grandi because he cannot say aristocrats yeah. or nobles, because, because they did allow. not exist that's in right. Florence. Yeah. In 1298, right. Jonathan said, okay, if you're an aristocrat, you have no business in, yeah. in ruling the that's city. You have to be an active member of society, yeah. 
creating wealth for, for the city. If you're a noble, you sit on your ass all day and you expect <laughs> the revenue coming from your estate. Uh, you, you, you have to join a guild. You have yeah. to join, like Dante, right? Dante joins a guild mm -hmm. for, for So the idea is that you know, Florence is the first anti-aristocratic constitution. Yeah. But you know, Machiavelli is definitely ironic because he says, you know, you, you can uh, delete them uh, officially or you can take away their titles. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I'm in the process of doing my uh, uh, naturalization to become yeah. an American citizen. Yeah. And one of the paragraphs is that I renounce to all my uh, aristocratic titles. <laughs> <in order. laughs> it's the deeply embedded idea of republicanism. Yeah. That's you right. want to become a That's citizen right. of the United States. All that yeah. is gone. And you know, for Machiavelli, he understood very well that there were ways in which you can wor work around yeah. that tradition. And of course, i grandi are these families, as you said, of the upper echelon yeah. of society that did not have an aristocratic titles as they would have in Rome, as yeah. duke and prince and count. But still, you know, they, they had exactly the same social sure. and economic role. I know there will be many more questions, but I think it's all the time we had. And I would like to thank uh, Virginia Cox. And I remind you that her book uh, is going to come out in September. And we're going, we already have a date. So stay tuned. And we're going to talk with her more in general about the Renaissance. And we presented Machiavelli, a portrait by Chris Chilins, And we have copies for sale upstairs. And Professor Chilins will sign them for you. Thank you all again very much.